Hey, Dean, welcome. Would you like to sit down? He was a tall man, a little taller than Dean, but not as wide. He, Kari, and it had just moved to town last month, and it had taken them a while to coordinate with a consultant. My name is Jim. Can I call you Dean? Of course, he replied. Okay, Dean. Mrs. Watson sent me her notes, but I would like to meet with each of you individually first to get your point of view before we all meet together. Would you mind getting started? Jim asked, which allowed Dean to relax. Ah, uh, sure, no problem. Here's my story. Dean began to tell his story. Sunday 1. Institution. What a damn Tuesday morning. I have been a production manager at a local factory for three years and at the plant as a whole for five years. Our 40-hour work week begins at 5.30 a.m. and ends at 4 p.m., four days a week, Monday through Thursday, 10-hour days. This was usually great as it gave me a 2.5 3-day weekend depending on what needed to be completed at the end of the week. But on Tuesday our paint system seriously malfunctioned. She broke down around 6.15, and by 8.30 we still didn't know how long it would take, but the prognosis was bleak. The managers met with the plant manager and the production director, and we decided to close the plant since the repairs would likely take more than a day, and we didn't want to run out of parts painted or have the paint crew deal with massive amounts of overtime. I let my teams go at 9 o'clock and around 10 o'clock. I decided I would sneak home to my wife and have some afternoon fun before our son, JT, got home from preschool. My wife, Kari, known as Car to me and friends, worked remotely as a medical billing expert, so she could always sneak away for a little fun with the right amount of motivation. She also worked part-time as a yoga instructor at a local yoga studio, and I loved her flexibility. So I waved to the boss and headed to the truck, thinking I'd surprise her and not call ahead. House. While driving down our busy street, where traffic was usually heavy but few people parked regularly, I noticed someone else's red Sentra parked in front of the Johansson's house. I just thought it was someone visiting them. They were retired, so it didn't bother me. I had other, more important things on my mind. I drove up to our house. Our bedroom was at the back of the house, so we rarely noticed any traffic noise or traffic in our driveway, so I wasn't worried about her hearing me before I entered the house. As I got out of the truck, I saw the rake I'd left over the weekend, and knowing how far can be meticulous about the yard, I decided to take it to the barn before surprising her. When I was walking behind the house, I heard strange sounds. At first I didn't understand what it was, so I stopped and listened. Someone was getting a good dose of sex, just like I was going to get in a minute. Then I realized that the noise was not coming from the neighbors, but from the open window of our bedroom. Now, being a bit of a pervert, I decided that Carr was pleasuring himself, so I took out my phone to film it for myself for later. I crept to the side window so as not to be noticed or surprise her suddenly. But it was I who received the surprise. On the phone screen, I saw that my wife was having sex with some man. I dropped the rake and stumbled, almost falling. My heart sank. The pulse rose to unhealthy levels, the face turned red, and anger flared. I turned on my heel, heading towards the front door with a murderous desire in my soul. I got halfway there when I just collapsed. I started crying. I never cried. But here I was crying. My life was over. My marriage was destroyed. I lost her. My anger and desire for revenge disappeared, leaving only self-pity and doubt. I couldn't think. My head was empty. I was on autopilot and found myself in my truck driving away. I couldn't see through the tears, so I stopped at the local park where JT and I went on the weekends to ride the slide. Park. Oh, how he loved to ride the slide. My chest shook and I started crying again. Loud sobs. Crap, I screamed out loud. JT will no longer have a full-fledged family. He will soon become the product of a destroyed home. Crap. My mind was racing, and I began to wonder how we got here. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17, served for four years and left. I worked dead-end jobs for almost a year until I finally got an interview with the local police department. It was there that I met Kari at the beginning of my sophomore year. She was a friend of my partner's wife, 
and they set us up on a blind date, inviting us to a summer barbecue as the only single people. She was 20 years old and I was 24, and she was the most beautiful girl at the picnic. Our eyes met and we were drawn to each other. We spent several hours talking in a corner of the yard, away from everyone else. I couldn't enjoy it. We parted, but not before exchanging phone numbers. When it came to Kari, I couldn't think straight. I couldn't wait the usual three days to call. I called her two hours later and asked her out. It was strange, but it felt like we were never apart, even though I knew we weren't, but that's how love worked for me. We got married later that year after a six-month engagement. Seven months after the wedding, my love told me that she was pregnant. This year has been difficult with schedules changing every quarter, and it has been difficult to find stability and routine in our lives. And as the baby approached, the situation only got worse. We discussed it and decided that the life of a police officer was not suitable for us when we had a family. I loved my job, but my growing family was more important. After almost three years of working as a police officer, we decided it was best to look elsewhere. A friend worked at a local factory and mentioned that they were looking for supervisors and I would be a great fit. I interviewed and was accepted shortly after. After two years, I was promoted to production manager. We both made good money. Our two-bedroom house was lovely and in a good area. We were middle class, aspiring to be upper middle class. I was 30 years old, she was 26, and I was 5. We were doing well and getting even better. Now I know that many infidelity stories mention how their sex life took a turn for the worse when one spouse started cheating. But that's not our case. We had sex like rabbits, often good, satisfying sex. Or so I thought. Kari rarely turns me down for sex. And just last weekend, she initiated a great sex session in the middle of a Saturday afternoon while I was sleeping. Now I wondered if it was pity sex or a sacrifice on her part to throw me off. We reached the seven-year mark when everything became routine and we knew what to expect from each other. Our lives revolved around JT, work, chores, and a little romance stolen here and there. I think it wasn't romance, just sex. But isn't that what happens in life and marriage? You don't go and sleep with a stranger and give your love to someone else, right? My brain screamed. Was this the first time? Is she in love? Does she despise me? Why doesn't she respect me so much? Is it really mine? I was brought out of my daze by a notification on my phone. Ding. Kari, I'm going to the store to get some groceries for dinner. Do you need anything? I looked at the phone, thinking. Yes, I need my wife back. I noticed a red Nissan Sentra speed past the park, followed shortly after by Kari's car, a green RAV4. Me, no, I'm fine. I had about 30 minutes, give or take, before she returned. Still not knowing the plan, I acted by inertia. In the Marines I was taught to shoot, move, and communicate. That's what I did. I needed to get away from this situation to think. House. I walked back to the driveway as a plan formed. I ran into the bedroom and stuffed my work clothes and shaving kit into my travel bag. I left my bag at the door, it was symbolic. I wanted her to see how I took my things when leaving the house. I loaded a few of my other more valuable items into the truck to keep that idiot from taking them. I decided to drive to our trailer by the lake to figure out what to do next. I had about ten minutes left. How can I explain my departure? Then it dawned on me. I picked up my phone and downloaded a short video to my home computer next to the living room. I transferred it to the TV. I turned up the volume and paused it. I was shooting and came up with a plan to go to the lake. I moved, collected my things and waited. Now I'm communicating. I sat in a chair and looked at the frozen scene on the TV. I was lost in the darkness that was my current life. I heard the front door, not knowing how much time had passed. Hey, you're home early. Yes, I muttered. She was in the kitchen, chatting. Something happened, she asked a little nervously. I assumed she was a little worried that I might have suspected something, but since she was in the kitchen, I couldn't see her face or body language and wasn't sure how to interpret her question. So I just pressed play. The sounds of the video filled the room. 
Are you watching adult videos? She asked, turning around the corner. At first, she saw me with red, swollen eyes and a tear-stained face. She then looked at the TV, and you could see the color draining out of her as she recognized what it was. First her water bottle fell, then she herself. She collapsed on the floor. Tears filled her eyes. I, I, she muttered. I stood up and walked past her. I stopped and looked at her. She was already in a terrible state, and this was just the beginning. Karian, I'm sorry I couldn't be the man you seem to want. I croaked through a suffocating voice. She howled. The video was on repeat, so the twenty seconds of her cheating started to repeat. I picked up my bag and left. I stopped at the park and sent her a message. I didn't dare talk to her. I'm going to the lake. Do not mess with me. I'll be there until Sunday. I will contact you on Monday to discuss next steps. Don't let JT see you having sex with that guy. I turned off the phone and threw it on the seat. It will be terrible. In seven years, we spent only a few nights apart. It was necessary. Lake. I was surprised that it was still light when I arrived, since it was outside the city and the journey took a little time. We bought this property last year and added an 18 trailer so we had a place to escape. This will be my home for the next week. I sat down on the sofa bed and stared blankly at the bathroom door. It got dark, but I didn't turn on the light. I did not eat. I fell asleep somewhere during the night and naturally woke up early. I got up and took a cold shower because I forgot we needed propane and left a full tank at home. I got dressed and went to work. Institution. The paint system still didn't work, so we started a phone tree and canceled my team's shift. Around 9, I called the lawyer from Google Search and made an appointment for 11. I worked until 10, took an early lunch, since I had not eaten since yesterday morning. I told my boss that I had personal matters to attend to and left for the day. Lawyer. What are my options? I asked. Mr. Thompson, we can start the paperwork right away and it will be filed by tomorrow and you can serve it to her by Friday, Mr. Franklin said or I can give you the contacts of some counselors, and you can see if there is anything that can be saved in the marriage. It often makes a big impression on the judge if you've already done it before you sit in court. It's often their first verdict, so you can get it done beforehand. How long will it take? I asked. Twelve weeks is typical. I sat for a minute, gave him a copy of the video that I had saved on a flash drive the day before and said, so, start the paperwork, but don't file or serve it to her. I finally said, I will send you a copy of our finances and debts. Divide everything in half. Let her take the RAV since it's paid for. I'll keep the truck and its payments. I want everything else eliminated. Standard parenting plan, he asked. Let me think about it. I love my son. It's too precious to just leave behind. But if I have to... I trailed off. I left the lawyer, went in, bought groceries and propane, and headed back to the lake. Lake. After returning to the trailer, I was a little angry because I didn't receive any messages from Kari. Then I remembered that I was in such a daze that I never turned the phone back on. My notifications went crazy as one after another filled my phone. Voicemails filled the answering machine. I deleted them all without reading or listening. Then I got angry that she didn't follow my instructions. I decided that it would still be nothing but lies. I can never trust her again. I grabbed a beer and sat outside, staring at the lake. I was just fucking miserable. Environment. I called the Johansons that night. Frank, this is Dean. What can I do for you, Dean? Hey, did you notice that little red Nissan Sentra that was parked outside your house yesterday? I started putting two and two together. Yeah, I've seen him here a couple of times lately. Is everything okay? Do you know the driver or who he came to see? No, I don't know. Is everything okay? Well, I'm not sure. Some things were missing from my house, and this was the only thing that looked strange. Can you keep an eye on him and let me know if you see him again? Sure, Dean, and thanks for the warning. You're welcome, thank you, I said and hung up. Frank was retired and very curious. 
There's hardly anything going on in the area that he doesn't see. I knew he would be a good spy. I filled out financial documents for a lawyer. Thursday. The paint system was back up and running, and we were trying to make up lost time with overtime and planned to work a full shift on Friday. I sent the financial information to the lawyer and then wrote to Kari. Me, can I call it tonight? Kari. Dean, I would never stop you from talking to your son, 6.30. I am okay. Kari, I love you, please come home. Me, don't contact me, I'll call you on Monday. Rest of the week. I talked to JT a few times, and he thought Dad was on a work trip. I didn't try to convince him otherwise. I mostly wallowed in self-pity. I have made a series of appointments with Mrs. Watson for consultations starting next week. I wanted Kari to go to the first session alone and for me to join for the second session. I also told her how I wanted our sessions together to go. At our first meeting together, I will ask questions and Kari will answer them. I told her that if she did not answer all the questions or if I felt that she was lying, I would stop the sessions and file for divorce. Mrs. Watson agreed, but insisted that if I was satisfied with the first session together, then I would have to fully participate in the remaining sessions. I agreed and asked her to prepare Kari for this session, although I did not give her questions in advance. Just tell her to be honest, was all I said. I also realized that I couldn't stay here no matter what decisions we made with Curry. I saw that we were looking for an operations manager for our Texas plant. I spoke to the boss, and he encouraged me to apply, so I did. I had an initial phone interview the following Friday with a more formal interview to be scheduled later. Our Texas plant was a terrible place, and no one wanted to work there, let alone run it, but this might be just what I need. And this solved many problems. Sunday, too. Factory, Monday afternoon. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, I called Frank. Hey, Dean. Hey, Fran, hey, have you seen that little red car lately? No, I didn't, and I was looking for him. Okay, thanks, Frank. Looks like he won't be coming back. We said goodbye. I was afraid of today. I was scared to call Kari. She did a good job of not contacting me, although she tried several times and I didn't respond. I thought about my next steps for a long time and finally called her around four. Hello? She asked quietly. Kari, I have options for you. Do you want to hear them? Dean, please. I interrupted her. Option one. I file for divorce and serve you with the papers this week. This will allow you to move on. Move in with your boyfriend and move on with your life. We'll figure out everything else as we go. Dean, come home. Option two, I will come to you today. Two, she interrupted me. No, wait, there's more. I'm coming to your house today, but I won't sleep with you. I'll sleep downstairs in the lounge. I will never sleep in this room or on this bed again. I'll move some clothes to the laundry rack and stay there. Do you want me to install an air mattress in the lounge? No, JT uses him during the day. I don't want to take away his space. The sofa will do. I answered. Do you know how long you will live there? She asked, and it was a fair question. Dean, this is still our home. No, it's not like that. Now it's just a house that you and I own, and now it's just your house. We will answer the question of how long in consultations starting Wednesday evening. We will conduct 12 sessions, and the first one will be just for you. I'll join next week. I heard her crying and sobbing over the phone and tears came to my eyes. I wasn't sure I could get through this. Which option will you choose, Kari? Option two, please, she stammered. Kari, you have to understand that you won't be able to see your boyfriend while I'm at your house. If I even hear that you were thinking about it, I will choose the first option for you. We'll be functional roommates. I don't want anything to do with you, but it needs me and he needs me. You understand? Silence. Sobbing. I need to hear that you understand, I said firmly. I understand. She sobbed. Dom Curry. I arrived at Curry's house about 40 minutes later. She met me at the door and exchanged greetings. It was obvious that she was crying. 
She came up to me and hesitantly hugged me. I didn't return her hug. When she left, I grabbed my bag and went downstairs, where I saw that she had placed a couple of extra pillows and blankets on the couch. A fresh sheet was pulled over him. Walking up the stairs, JT slammed into me at full speed, screaming, Daddy. I went down and hugged him tightly, told him I loved him and missed you. I went up to our old bedroom, gathered some more clothes, and moved them downstairs while Kari finished preparing dinner. I returned to find the table set and ready for dinner. Dinner was quiet except for JT talking about everything I'd missed over the last week. Wednesday, Session 1 Kari Kari and I were polite to each other for the first few days. There were no big fights, just a lot of I love yous and requests for forgiveness. I never answered directly. I gave her the address and she went to see a counselor while I looked after JT that night. A little over an hour later, she returned home. Her eyes were red and her beautiful face was tear-stained and smeared with makeup. It tore me apart. I loved her so much and missed her slender body in my arms and in my bed, but I knew I couldn't give in. She sat down in the living room next to me and spoke. Mrs. Watson mentioned that you have a list of questions for me for the next session. That's it. Will it be a problem? No, but can you tell me what questions you have? You can ask them now if you want. I'll be honest. I think you can figure it out yourself. I said, seeing that she didn't like my answer. Okay, please don't forget that you once loved me, she whispered. I wouldn't be here if I didn't love you, Kari. But you broke my trust. That's something I'm not sure I can get back. JT and I already ate. You can heat something up if you want. I told her. No thanks, I have no appetite. She said, getting up and going to her room. The rest of the week was similar. Silence. We just went through our days and nights. No one spoke, and there was a lot of sadness and tears. I had a phone interview and was asked to come for an in-person interview in a couple of weeks, and I agreed. Their assistant called me, and we started planning. We were going to do it in one day. Sunday 3. The first half of the week passed without incident. More silence. I was preparing for the joint session, reviewing my questions and events up to this point. It was very difficult for me to understand where we went wrong. I could not find a single reason in our relationship that could lead to such an end. I like to think of myself as an observant person. I try not to miss too much, but I was completely taken aback. This was certainly going to be an important part of our session on Wednesday. Wednesday, session two, both of us. We arranged for Kari's mother to watch JT and asked her to keep him overnight and take him to preschool. Kari told her everything, so she was very sympathetic and glad we were looking for help. We both felt it was going to be a long and hard evening. Okay, Dean, you said you had questions for Kari. The word is yours. Mrs. Watson announced to both of us. Just remember to be civil and that you're both here because you love each other. Yes, madam. I replied, piercing my gaze at Kari, who was sitting opposite me. I want short and precise answers. I don't need you to go into detail, and if you lie to me, I will divorce you first thing in the morning. Ready? I asked. It was clear that she was nervous and fidgeting in her seat. Yes. Do you love me? Yes, very. Short answers, please. I said, feeling myself slipping back into the days of police interrogations, and she felt it. My gaze was empty and my tone was even. I tried to keep my emotions under control. You love him? No. What did he give you that I couldn't? This question stunned her. You could see how she began to sweat. I knew that I couldn't just ask, why? This deeply psychological question couldn't be answered so simply. She would be confused and her answer would be complicated and leave both of us confused. I knew from interrogation classes that I had to coax the truth out of her little by little so that she wouldn't even realize she was telling the truth until it was too late. I don't think she expected this turn of events. I, ah, uh, you gave me everything I ever needed. He couldn't compare to you. She answered. It cannot be true. If that were the case, you would never feel the need to find something from another man. I said evenly. 
please don't be angry, but... She began. I'm not angry, Kari. I'm furious. I'm very upset and disappointed in you. But... Please... Continue. Sarcasm sounded in my voice. It's... It's just that we're stuck in a rut. It was interesting to be desired again. I... I think... And he was courting me. Trying to seduce me. Now it was my turn to sit stunned. I have always believed that it is a man's role to lead the family. This meant meeting all the family's needs. It never occurred to me that Kari needed to be pursued. Seduce me. I thought just telling her I loved her was enough. But apparently I left the gate open and a coyote got in. I wasn't really angry at any of them. I felt like it was my responsibility to make her happy, but I still felt a huge sense of loss and anger about the situation. I made a few quick notes in my pocket notebook, a habit I picked up as a police officer, something I needed to think about and come back to later. So I don't want you? Is this what you think? I blurted out louder than I intended. Is your life so boring? Having a faithful husband and a little boy who loves his mother isn't enough? I felt the anger building up inside me, directed at her, and I decided to change direction a little. Who is this lover that you were more interested in than your husband could? I'm sure she knew this question was coming, but it still seemed to take her by surprise. Maybe it was my aggressive posture, straight back, arms raised to my chest, and although I was still seated, my left leg was leading my approach and my right shoulder was slightly back. I, uh, Dean. She stuttered, trying to absorb my comments and formulate a response. I know that you love me, she said, looking at the floor, unable to look at me. He's a yoga instructor at Yoga Spot, and he flirted with us all and made us feel special. He realized he could prey on women who had been married for a while. I think because he realized that no relationship is perfect. He was just different. He added a spark, he flirted, and made me feel wanted again. She fell silent, and I began to breathe heavily again. He wasn't bigger or better than you. In fact, he couldn't come close to you. He wasn't half the man you are, baby. I wasn't the only one who fell into his trap. So does this make it okay, I began, since you're not the only married woman he's had sex with, he must have been in heaven with so many women willing to sleep with him. Damn, Kari. Some guy flirts a little, and you immediately fall to your knees. Now what? It was more of a rhetorical question, and I did not expect an answer from her. When did he manage to seduce you? I started to build a chain of thoughts. As a manager, my shift didn't end at four like everyone else's, I still had daily production reports to complete, preparation for the next day, so I was often not home until after five or even six, and then I usually went to bed by nine as I got up at 3.30 to get ready for work and was at the factory by four in the morning. I could see how my schedule offered her a lot of free time, but I knew it didn't leave until after eight and was usually home by three, so when did she have time? I get it. So those Friday night classes... They were with him, weren't they? Yes, she whispered barely audibly. And those working days on Saturdays, were they to compensate for the time you spent having sex with him? And not because of the increased workload, I tried my best to contain my anger. No, we would sometimes just drink coffee. She couldn't or wouldn't look at me. She saw that the pieces were starting to fall together for me. Bullshit. Are you saying you didn't have sex? Were you just chatting? Ah, ah, sometimes. Her face turned red, admitting her mistakes. You allowed your wantonness to take up our time, Kari. Don't you see this? We were supposed to spend long weekends together, but you preferred to play sex games with another man. Again, these were more statements of fact than questions. I began to realize that she was more of an accomplice than a victim here. How many times... How many times has he made you feel special and wanted? I asked. I don't know. She began. I interrupted her mid-sentence. How many times has he slept with you? I asked more directly. It only happened three times, and it was the only time at our house. I know it doesn't mean much, but maybe it means something to you. She answered quickly, almost as if it was learned. I stopped for a moment, my heart pounding. 
I just looked at her. Tears streamed down her face. She tried to say something, and I practically screamed, Stop. I flipped through my notebook, rereading my notes from my conversation with Frank, our neighbor. Bullshit. This was a statement. What? Kari asked, not sure what I meant. Do you want to try again? What do you mean? Her eyes widened, her pupils were dilated. I think she knew she was caught. I talked to Johansson. Frank said he remembers seeing that red Nissan a few times. So I know you slept with it at our house. A lot. I'm back in cop mode. Do you want to try again? I asked. She burst into tears and loud sobs. She couldn't answer me even if she wanted to. I looked at Mrs. Watson, who was handing Kari a box of tissues. Disappointment was written all over her face. I think she was just as overwhelmed as Kari by how much I knew. Kari must not have been as honest with her as we had hoped. I think we're done here. I got up and went to the door. The last thing I heard was her even louder and more desperate sobs. Dean, wait, Mrs. Watson called, but I was already going down the stairs. I left, leaving the two of them at the front door. I was no longer sad. Now I was furious. Furious at his wife. I found myself in front of a local bar, a real meeting place. I contemplated going in and finding the first available woman and evening out the score. I wasn't special, just an ordinary guy, but I thought that I could even find some woman to do nasty things in a bar like this. Was I that desperate? Will this make me happier? Even though I was incredibly angry at Kari, it would completely ruin my marriage and make me just like her. Was I really ready to do this to JT? But more importantly, was I willing to do this to myself? I really need to figure out what I want. Instead, I grabbed my tablet and headed to a 24-hour donut shop. He took a large coffee and sat down at one of the tables. I knew that Jane had posted the names, photos, and biographies of all the instructors on her yoga center's website. I opened the site to understand what Mr. I have better sex than you looks like. He was easy to find since he was the only man on the site. Elliot Watts. Damn it. Not Elliot or Elliot and Elliot. Even his biography says so. He has worked at many different yoga centers in the city and out of state. I knew from Carrie's experience that it was not uncommon for small studios to hire part-time instructors to make class schedules more flexible for clients. I studied his photo carefully, as if it might tell me how he got into my wife's yoga pants. Some sneaky little bastard. There was even his class schedule. I took a screenshot of everything. I looked at my watch. It was not too late, a little after seven, and I had one more thing to do. I searched through my contacts and pressed the dial. Hello? Tommy dot 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 it quotes Dean. Are you busy? Oh, hi, Dean, no, just sitting outside some creep's house, waiting for his secretary to finish with him so I can take some photos. Tommy and I have been friends for several years. We worked together in the police force, but he had to take medical retirement after a particularly serious accident that meant he could no longer be a police officer. He's been working as a private investigator for a couple of years now, and right now he was the one I needed. This is Quick Buddy. I need to hire you to find out something about the little bastard who's trying to have sex with Carrie. I lied. I wasn't ready to share my shame. Oh, damn, I have to go. Send me the materials, okay? He said in a hurry. Done. I'll call you in a couple of days. And I hung up and sent the screenshots I took. I felt better now that I had something planned, even if it wasn't much. But every time I thought I was getting the hang of it, I would fall back again. It felt like something important. I needed a little victory, even if it was minor. I packed my things and got back into the SUV. I'll be at Carrie's by 8, and I have to get up early for work tomorrow. When I arrived at the house, everything was glowing. I saw Carrie at the table through the window. I walked in and stood at the head of the table, ready for a fight. Are you divorcing me? She asked through tears. I told you I'd do it if you lied. Isn't it? We both knew the answer, but I wanted her to say it. Yes, she sobbed. Did you lie? Yes, she answered, looking at the table. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't leave right now. My tone was cold. 
I quit the yoga center the day after, after you saw us, she said through sobs and hiccups. Does Jane know why? No, I was too embarrassed to tell her. She warned us all that he was a problem. Why did she leave him if she knew he was trouble? I asked. I don't know exactly. He brought in a lot of new clients. I think that's why. She responded logically, and I couldn't argue with a good business decision, even if it temporarily caused a rift in the studio. I think I need to make this rift bigger and not worth it, I thought as I watched my wife struggle with her new reality. How long did this last? I asked. I wasn't lying when I said it's only happened three times in the last three weeks. But in the house? Yes, she answered. And that was just the sex part. Yes. Her answers were short and to the point, I could see that she was finally aware of the possible consequences. But the flirting and seduction had been going on for three months before that. So it wasn't just three weeks. Was it? No, just had sex three times in three weeks, she managed to say. See, that's what I'm talking about. You let that little bastard circle you for three damn months until he got to your panties. What do you think our relationship would be like if you spent that extra time on me? You left us, Kari, long before you had sex. You? You're right, Dean. Her voice softened, and she could hardly tell the difference between crying and heavy breathing, but she understood my meaning. Okay, but that wasn't my question. She looked at me blankly. How long were you planning on sleeping with him? That's what I really meant. Don't you dare lie to me, I blurted out when I saw her confusion. I, I don't know. I was scared and I felt very guilty. And I knew he was having sex with others. I knew I had to stop it and I felt like I was close to it. But it was a little exciting. She was completely broken. Why did you lie? I was afraid, she answered. I know I screwed up big time, Dean. I also know that you could really hurt both of us physically if you wanted to. Your self-control and restraint are some of the rarest qualities in men today. I can't tell you how sorry I am that I tested you. But what hurts the most is the way I crushed you. You've always been the strongest man I've ever known. Hell, you didn't even cry at your father's funeral, but when I saw you sitting in the chair that day, I realized how much I had screwed up. When I looked into your eyes and saw only emptiness there, I mean, your eyes always brought me so much joy. They sparkle when you're happy, or fade when you are sad. I could always tell your mood just by looking into your eyes. But when I looked into your eyes that day, I saw emptiness, no fear, just emptiness scared me more than any threat of physical violence. Then I realized that I had done something that we could never undo. Carrie sat staring at me with her red eyes. I also knew how much this place meant to you. I knew how wrong I was for not respecting you in your own home. And that's why I lied. That's right, Kari. You've disrespected me in the worst way I can imagine right now. I don't know how we can handle this. I said evenly but you still haven't answered the question. She looked confused. Give me one reason why I shouldn't leave you right now. JT, that's all she said. In fact, at that very moment, I decided to divorce her. I just wasn't ready for this. I didn't want to go back to the lake. The damn road was too long, and I wanted to see what would happen with the job in Texas. I also wanted to be closer to JT, so I was almost as good at lying as she was. We'll see you at next week's session. I left her at the table and went downstairs. She laid her head on the table and burst into tears. I found plenty of reasons to be late every night for the rest of the week, and then took it out for a walk in the park and fishing on the weekend. We were barely at home. I was making up for any possible future time that I might have lost due to the divorce. Sunday 4. Monday. Tommy called that morning and asked to meet for lunch. My first thought was, this is not good. And of course, this was not good. It turns out that Elliot is a serial seducer and loves to win over married women. He usually leads them on for a while and then tries to get something from them. Money, clothes, cars or whatever, and blackmails the wives with photos that he secretly does during sex. Tommy told me what he found out. 
He also found out that our local courts are full of lawsuits and complaints filed against this little scumbag. He seems to be so slippery and relying on the spouse's shame if the photos get out to friends and family that they give him what he wants without much resistance. He concluded, but admitted that he could not accurately calculate how many marriages he had destroyed during this time, but knew of four cases recently. I was surprised how much information he had on our little friend, but it turned out that Elliot was already part of an infidelity case that Tommy was working on for another husband of one of the clients at the yoga center. Tommy didn't know that night because I didn't share his name or details. He slept with her, didn't he? Yes. There was no point in lying at this stage. Brother, don't do anything stupid. This bastard isn't worth it. He begged. I had no plans to do anything, Tommy. I wasn't sure he believed me. You're not good enough to get away with it. It hurts, Tommy, I chuckled. But he was right. That didn't mean I didn't think we shouldn't talk. Tuesday. I double-checked the schedule of Elliot. His last class ended at 8.30 that night. I sat in the back of the parking lot, waiting. Staff were required to park away from the entrance to leave limited spaces for clients, which placed instructors in a secluded part of the parking lot. This forced the staff to walk a fair distance to the door, making it a good place for an ambush. The way the buildings blocked the view from both the street and other businesses gave me confidence that I could do it. I was glad that Kari only took day classes and didn't have to come out here alone at night. I had already drilled a one eight inch hole in his right rear tire and replaced it with an old roofing nail I found on the road. At 8.22 am, I got out of my truck and stood in the shadows with a police baton in my right hand. It will pass quickly, I have practiced this technique many times. I knew my primary and secondary goals. I knew what to do. I knew how to make it painful without turning it fatal. I stood there, my thoughts drifting to JT, how it would grow if I were caught. Will he be better off with his father in prison? I thought about the new life I would lead in Texas. The interview was scheduled for Thursday. Was Tommy right? We always caught those thick heads who tried to do this. What makes me think I'm so much better? At about 8.50, I saw my victim going out with some lonely wife. He walked her to the car and kissed her. He deserves it. He deserved it. Worked hard for this. The lonely wife started the car and just sat there. I could still do it. Elliot, I walked up to my car and saw that it was tilted to one side. Went around the right rear wheel. His back was to me. I readied my left hand for a block as I raised the baton to shoulder level and began to step out of the shadows. In three seconds, the job would be done. The lonely wife put the car in reverse. Elliot jumped up and ran, screaming. I returned to the shadows. Elliot managed to catch up with her before she left the parking lot. She stopped and I heard him ask for a ride and say he would pick up the car tomorrow. I hurried back to my truck and just sat there, breathing heavily, my heart pounding. The truth is that I stopped for a moment before Elliot jumped up. The realization of what I was about to do hit me. I was going to beat up a man for sleeping with my wife weeks after it happened. Is this who I really am? The answer was simple, no. I confirmed my decision. I was divorcing Carrie. I returned to Carrie's house, put the baton in storage, and went into the basement. It's not me. This is not the person I wanted or Carrie to remember. My father taught me how to be a man. There is no need to be violent. A real man should not seek physical revenge. There are other ways. Carrie hating him and herself for the rest of her life would be one of those ways. Their actions together were the cause of this event, the reason for the divorce and the destruction of her family. A real man takes responsibility for his actions and the actions of those under his care. Kari and JT are under my care, and I am responsible for their actions. I would be disappointed in JT if he even thought about what I was going to do. I knew my father would be disappointed in me too. He taught me better. I knew better. I was better than that. The Marine Corps taught me to be gentle until it was time to not be gentle. At the academy, I was taught the rules of engagement as well as the escalation of force. What I had planned did not fit any of these definitions. I would be completely wrong if I did. 
In fact, I had already committed a crime just by planning it. I needed to distance myself from these thoughts. I really needed to understand why Kari cheated. What was so interesting about this guy? Wednesday, Session 3, Both of Us. Welcome, Dean and Kari. Thanks for coming again. Mrs. Watson opened the door and led us inside. Mrs. Watson, if you don't mind. Do I have a few more questions for Carrie? I asked permission to explore our issues a little deeper in my own way. Carrie, is this right for you? Mrs. Watson watched Carrie carefully, who fidgeted in her seat and looked anywhere but at me. Yeah, um, I think so. Carrie squeezed out. She didn't seem confident in herself or me. I guess I don't blame her for that. I'm not sure I would trust myself either. So, Kari, last time we talked a little about why you got involved with this guy. Can we talk about it a little more? I tried to be gentle and non-accusatory. I really wanted to know. You mentioned that we were in a routine and this guy was stalking you. Wasn't I stalking you? Dean, you're a good husband, a great father. But I don't want to hurt you anymore. Are you sure you want this? asked Carrie. Carrie, I think Dean needs to see your point. If you two are to have any chance of undoing the damage. Mrs. Watson contributed. Please, Carrie, continue. Well, we stopped talking about us. I mean, we talked about work, about JT, but we didn't talk about our feelings. I listened as she continued. We said I love you every day, but you almost never said I looked sexy. You didn't touch me with desire unless you wanted to have sex, and even then it felt forced and obligatory. I didn't feel passion every day, not like I used to. She paused for a minute, collecting her thoughts. I can't remember the last time you brought me flowers. I know it might seem stupid to you, but something so simple means you were thinking about me. I just became part of the house, I took care of JT, I took care of the house, and then you when you came home, and when he started following me, I knew it wasn't real, but my lonely mind made me believe that it was so, and soon I fell victim to his spell. I took in everything she said, there was a lot to sort through. Is it really my responsibility to help her find meaning in her daily life? So if I bought you flowers, you wouldn't sleep with this guy? My anger bubbled to the surface and was evident in my tone. No, it's not that simple. Dean I. She began and then stopped. Do you know what I need from my wife? I asked. Respect, that's what. And you certainly don't show it by having sex with some handsome boy in my bed, I said loudly. I respect you, she said. Really? I think maybe I should show that respect too by sleeping with some little prostitute one day. My anger boiled over. It seemed like she wasn't listening to me. The rest of the session went pretty much the same. Mrs. Watson talked a lot about how respect is important to the male psyche and how a woman needs to feel wanted and appreciated for being a woman. Of course, many other things were said between the two of us, but that was the gist of it. We also talked about trust and lies. I thought about the lie for a moment. Not only had Kari lied to me, but I was going to lie to her. She didn't know I was going to Texas to interview for a new job. We're done for today, and I'm not sure either of us felt any better about it. The road home was quiet. When we returned to Kerry, we went our separate ways. Kari mentioned that she was picking up JT tomorrow. We figured it would be best for all of us if he stayed at her mom's Wednesday nights for a while. Thursday. I got up early and left Kerry's house for the airport. They wanted me to stay the night, but I refused, telling them I had a small child to return home to so I returned that afternoon. I arrived late and Kari was sitting on the couch, crying with a lot of crumpled napkins around her. You're very late, she said. Yeah, it was a complete mess today. Why didn't you let me know, she asked. Sorry, I'm not used to paying attention to roommates, but next time I'll let you know. She sobbed. She also noticed that I was dressed better than usual. Were you on a date? What? I growled. I'm not the one who broke our vows, I said more quietly. She sobbed harder. Her insecurities showed up more than ever before. It broke my heart. She broke my heart. We had top executives from the corporate office today, and I had to look my best. 
I lied, then just turned around and walked downstairs. Revisiting our conversations over the past few weeks, I realized how she could have thought I was on a date. Divorce was practically a foregone conclusion at this stage. Something significant had to happen if we were to save this marriage. My guts were knotted again. Friday and weekend. Since we had no production tasks scheduled and I only had some paperwork to do, I decided to go to work a little later. Since I decided that beating up a pretty boy wasn't for me, I came up with a secondary plan that would put him in his place, but would also give me a little sense of revenge against Carrie and everyone else who slept with this guy. I started this at the kitchen table with Carrie right after it left for school. I placed in front of her the package that Tommy had prepared about Elliot. Did you know you're just another one in his stable? I asked calmly. She opened the package and looked at the information in front of her. Her eyes widened and a look of panic appeared on her face. Did he ask for something? I asked. No, not from me. But I heard that one of the clients might have bought him something. I don't know what exactly. She hesitated slightly. I don't think he would do that, she said. Carrie, don't be so naive. He was just waiting to see what he could get out of you, I reacted. He didn't love you. Kari, you were just a piece of ass. He would leave you as soon as he found someone else to have regular sex with and would blackmail you by threatening to tell me as soon as you stopped or wouldn't give him what he wanted. I said, where did you get this anyway? And how do you know about all this? Tommy dug this up as part of a divorce investigation he's doing. One of your girlfriends is about to end up in divorce court if you don't get your head out of your ass. It was too damn early to be so worried. I'm showing you this to warn you. I'm going to leave a package for every woman at the yoga center on the way to work this morning. I said, What? She screamed. Yeah, I'm turning off the tap for a handsome guy. Just thought you should know so you can turn off your phone. Today is going to be a terrible day at the yoga center. Please don't, Dean. Please, they're my friends. Jane had nothing to do with this. Please don't do this. She was practically begging at this stage. Okay, then you do it. And I want you to admit that you slept with him. Tell everyone how you became his prostitute. Call it repentance. I looked her straight in the eyes. I'll talk to Jane later. You should share this with all the women at the yoga center and let them know what's going on. If Jane really is your friend, you won't want her to get overwhelmed. I left a few bags on the table and walked out the door. I thought it might go like this, so I arranged with Tommy to have one of his men watch the place all day to see if she actually went there. At about 11, I received a call from Tommy saying that she had gone there. She went and, according to the observer, she could be seen through the window talking to Jane and several of the regular customers. One woman came out immediately with a package and Carrie came out crying a minute later. It didn't seem to be a pretty sight. During the day, three more women came out, crying, with bags in their hands. I never called Jane. She didn't need to hear anything from me. At approximately 5.30 p.m., I received another update from Tommy. It looks like Elliot came in around 4.30 and came out 30 minutes later absolutely furious. He had a package and was screaming at Jane, holding the door open so everyone could hear his hysterics. As he walked to his car, a young man in casual clothing approached him, spoke to him for a few seconds, and handed him a second envelope. This pissed me off again Elliot, and he began to swear at the supposed courier and Jane. The situation became so violent that the detective was prepared to physically intervene or call the police. But Elliot changed his mind, got into his car, and drove out of the parking lot at high speed. She softened up a bit on Saturday and wanted to talk about the divorce comment I made the day before. I brushed it off as a way to get attention, but if we can't sort out this mess, we might actually end up there. I learned from Tommy later that Elliot had been fired by Jane, sued by her aggrieved husband, and was under investigation for fraud and extortion against several wives. Somewhere along the way, the poor guy got mugged by some bad guys and was beaten so badly he ended up in the IQ for a week. I was fine with that. Oh yes, they were caught. The robbers turned out to be hired thugs, and they told everything about the husband they abandoned. 
Apparently, he had been keeping an eye on the guy and waiting a year to make sure the yoga center wives weren't involved, thinking it would be harder to find a connection. This is wrong. The cost of his wife's infidelity continues to mount, first with an expensive divorce, child support, lawyers, and now a prison sentence. Weeks 5 and 6 The next couple of weeks passed relatively quietly, although we discussed the file on Elliot, which I made Carrie take to the yoga center for our weekly session. Mrs. Watson disapproved of my actions and condemned my thirst for revenge, but it made me feel a little better and gave Carrie a little insight into how I was feeling. She seemed to be starting to see things from my perspective, because we started communicating more outside of counseling and Mrs. Watson began working with us more on how to rebuild trust and respect for each other. She also suggested we try a guaranteed date night every week. It seemed a little premature and a standard solution from a consultant, but we agreed, so we arranged for a babysitter for a Saturday evening with a teenager from next door and made plans. I was still determined to get a divorce, but some of the things Mrs. Watson said made sense to me. Friday. I needed some time to think, so I took myself off work Friday morning and headed out to the lake to check out the trailer and do some fishing. When I arrived at the lake, I looked around and cleaned up a bit, made sure everything was in order with the trailer, and also noted what I would need if and when I had to sell it, either for a divorce or to move. I grabbed a couple of fishing rods, some bait, and my favorite fishing chair and headed out to the lake. I set up the chair, set up for bottom fishing, and cast the fishing rod. He put down the fishing rod and opened the Coca-Cola and cookies. I needed this, so I let my thoughts run away. I had a lot of things to think about. JT. The most important was JT. Many questions ran through my mind. He was truly innocent in this mess. He never asked for this or had any part in creating it. He needed his father almost as much as I needed him. What am I going to do with it? Am I willing to stay with a cheating, lying bitch just so he can have a good childhood? Can I do it? Even if I can, what kind of life will we both have? Is he my biological child? I hate that I even thought about it, but I think this question must be asked. Is this the first time she's cheated? My intuition told me he was mine, he was a carbon copy of me, so much so that Carrie got angry when people asked what traits he got from her family. I also told myself that he was born so early in our marriage that we were still in our honeymoon, it was unlikely that she would cheat then. I reminded myself to ask her this question at the next session, her answer should tell me everything I needed to know. Next therapy session. These thoughts led me to think about our next therapy session, we really need to discuss the elephant in the room trust. How can we restore trust? Will I ever be able to trust her again? Damn, now I lied to her. Will she ever trust me again? I was so angry with her and wanted her to hurt that I felt it was right to lie to her and keep my interview and conversations with the lawyer a secret. She already knew I was talking to Tommy and she wasn't happy about it. Perhaps it had more to do with her embarrassment and humiliation at being caught rather than the act itself. The tip of my rod twitched, once, twice. I hooked and forgot about my problems for a few minutes, landing a decent channel catfish. I attached it to the rope, pressed it to the shore, cast the line again, and returned to my thoughts. I loved going fishing with my dad, and we always had great conversations on the water. I remember him talking to me about marriage shortly before Carrie and I got married. Son, I'm very proud of the man you've become. And Carrie is a fantastic woman. But you know marriage brings its own challenges and new lessons. He said as he watched his float drift through our favorite crappy fishing spot. You become the head of the family. Do you know what that means? He asked me. Well, I guess that means I'm in charge. I said proudly thinking that I answered correctly. He laughed loudly, scaring away all the fish in the area. Well, in a way, but what it really means is that you are responsible for your wife and ultimately your children. Whatever happens in your home, you have to take responsibility. I didn't understand it then, but when I remembered his words, my thoughts took me somewhere else. My current mess. My father always talked about cause and effect, how one action actually leads to something else, how an action can cause an effect of a different nature. 
My natural thought immediately went to how Carrie's actions would lead to our divorce and JT coming from a divorced family, how Carrie will eventually remarry and another man will raise my son. I hated her again at that moment. Then my thoughts wandered further, did I do something first that led to Carrie cheating? Of course not, I'm the one who got cheated on, not Carrie. She said that I stopped caring for her, and our life became a routine, according to her. But that doesn't justify her cheating, maybe refusing sex or calling me a bastard, but not cheating with another man. This was far beyond fair and equal, it was downright evil. But this could make her vulnerable to the advances of a handsome boy. My dad would always get mad at me when I left the chicken coop door open at night. He would say, by leaving the door open, you're inviting the coyote to come and steal our chickens. Leaving Carrie unattended, did I leave the door open for a coyote? If I was the head of the family, am I responsible for not protecting my wife from those with bad intentions? Hell no. She is an adult. She is responsible for her actions. But what if? That's what I needed to work on. Does a real man take responsibility for those under his care? I know that at work, as a manager, if someone on my team screws something up, I'm ultimately responsible for it. That doesn't mean they won't be punished for it, but ultimately it's me who has to stand in front of everyone and accept the blame, and together with the team we work towards making amends. Is it the same in marriage? She messed up and needs to be punished. Should it be fired or face the brunt of the punishment if it was Carrie's fault? Divorce punishes not only Carrie, but also JT and me. My head was spinning, and I caught the rod movement too late and missed the supposed catfish. I baited the hook again and sat looking out at the lake, thinking these thoughts over and over again. Everyone has their own definition of what a man is, I guess I never really thought about mine. I have done many things that can be considered courageous, being a Marine, a police officer, a husband, and a father. Both in the Corps and in the police force, I saw examples of great men and bad men. I have seen men who abused their wives. I've seen men cheat on their wives. I have seen men who have forgiven others for their wrongdoings. I've seen men take responsibility for things they couldn't fully control. Which of them is the better man? I asked myself. No one would blame me if I left Carrie and moved on after what she did, the sex and the lies. I would be justified, but would I be right? And most importantly, would I live up to my idea of what a real man is? That was the million-dollar question. A few hours and four catfish caught ago, I was determined to divorce Carrie. Now I hesitated a little. This led me to my next big question. If I really want to understand what motivated Carrie, and if I want to save our family, I need to be a more active participant in these therapy sessions. I need to participate, and so far I've just been present. I really love Kari, and she broke my trust, but I think I owe it to both myself and JT to try to see if this can be fixed. I picked up the phone and called one of the best restaurants in town and made a reservation for us for Saturday night. I decided this was a good place to start, then sent a message to Kari. Me, let's go to the McFadden's for dinner tomorrow night. Me, we have a reservation for seven. Carrie, okay, a little pompous. Me, it's a date, isn't it? Me, this is my attempt, do you want a dough? Carrie, yes. Kari, sorry, I was just surprised, that's all. Carrie, should I dress up? Me, Yes, I heard they have a quartet and a dance floor. Me. Do you remember anything from our wedding ballroom dancing lessons? Carrie. Oh my God, yes. Carrie. I'd love to. Me. So this is a date. Carrie. Yeah, it's a date. It was late afternoon by the time I finished cleaning the fish and cleaned up the trailer, then headed back to town. I felt better about it. I decided it was time to take on the lead role again. When I got back to Carrie's house, I put the fish in the freezer, and we had a quiet evening. Kari constantly glanced at me during dinner and looked away when I caught her doing it. There was bewilderment and surprise in her gaze. I wondered what she was thinking, but she avoided the topic when I asked. What? Um, nothing. That's all I could get from her. Saturday. 
In the morning, I was busy with standard Saturday chores, mowing the lawn, trimming the flower beds, and trying to stay busy. I was really nervous about our date that night. What will it mean if everything goes well? What will it mean if it doesn't work out? I was still dealing with the thoughts that had come over me the day before. One thing I've decided is that I really love Carrie. I needed a few tools for some minor home repairs, so I went into the house and said, Carathat, I'm going to make a short trip. Reservation for seven. Do you want to leave around 6.15? I asked. It sounds good, she answered. I bought the things I needed and saw a roadside stand with flowers. I stopped and bought a bouquet. Kari had already dropped it off and was getting ready for her date when I got home. I cleaned myself up and picked out my someone's getting married suit. Luckily, it still fit. I got dressed and walked through the garage back to the front door, picking up the flowers I had bought. I rang the doorbell at 6.15. Dean, can you open the door? Kari shouted. When I didn't answer, she walked to the door and opened it. She looked great. Her slender, toned body was clad in a red, tight dress that accentuated her figure and brought attention to her curves. I stood and looked at her, taking in the scene. Flowers? she asked. It's a date, isn't it? I answered with a slight smile. Trying to impress this hot girl who lives here, do you think this will work? Well, if a handsome guy with flowers at her door doesn't work, I'm free. She winked, taking the flowers, and I followed her inside. I just need a second. She put the flowers in a vase, took her purse, and was ready to go. I opened the door of her RAV4, like a man would do when trying to impress his date. We chatted a bit on the way to the restaurant, both nervous. After a short wait for our table, we relaxed a bit after a cocktail. As a date, it was awkward. What should you say to a woman who cheated on you? or a man who saw you with someone else. We didn't know, so we talked about JT, work, and avoided talking about therapy or anything important. After a nice dinner and a few drinks, we moved to a small cocktail table near the dance floor. We watched several couples dance, performing classic ballroom dances such as the Foxtrot and Waltz. Finally, I stood up and asked if she wanted to dance, she agreed, and we went out onto the dance floor, it was a waltz. We soon realized that we didn't remember our lessons well and moved on to a simple step like at school graduation. She felt good in my arms, although she kept her distance, following the eight-inch prom rule. As the music played, she moved closer and closer until her body was pressed against mine. It was the first time in over a month that we had touched each other in more than just a tense, casual hug. After a few songs, we sat down and had another drink. Well, she drank it, and I switched to Coca-Cola since I was driving. We danced some more, and the more she drank, the more comfortable she became, and she melted into my arms. But that wasn't what this evening was about, and I wasn't ready for it, so I suggested we call it a night and go back to her house. We picked up JT from the babysitter on the way home, and I was carrying the sleeping boy when she opened the door for us, and we had an awkward moment outside JT's room. Thank you for such a wonderful evening. I had already forgotten how much fun we have when we dance together, she whispered. You were dazzling today, Kari. I can't believe I almost forgot how beautiful you are when you dress up, I choked out. I ran my right index finger along her chin, leaned down as she raised her face towards me, and kissed her right cheek. She looked at me with disappointment, turned around and stomped into her room as best she could in her 12 cm heels. I grinned and went downstairs. I thought it wouldn't be that easy. The next morning I woke up and felt a little sad. Opening my eyes, I realized that Kari had come down at night and snuggled up to me. My arm was draped over her and her head was resting on my other arm. She was so calm and perfect while she slept. I loved feeling her body next to me. I pulled her a little closer and fell asleep again. An hour later I woke up again and she was also moving. I'm sorry, she said in a sleepy voice. I just needed to feel you close. I miss it so much. I stood up, looked down at her, and touched her cheek with the back of my hand. It was nice. I missed it too. I took my things and went to the bathroom on the first floor, and she went back up to her room. I watched her cute little butt cheeks bounce on the stairs. 
I should be angry. She deliberately violated my personal space, but at that moment I was not ready for this quarrel. She prepared breakfast and thanked me again for the flowers and the wonderful evening. We talked, but about nothing important, neither of us wanted to break the spell. It was the first time in weeks that we were more than just polite to each other. The rest of that Sunday passed quietly. Sunday 7. Kari was friendly the first few days of the week, and we got along well, with her sneaking touches from time to time. Nothing over the top, but the implication was that she wanted more. Wednesday, Session 6 both. In this session I wanted to talk about trust because I didn't know how we would restore it. I especially didn't want this session because I had to confess to Kari about my deceitful behavior over the past weeks. I promised myself and JT that I would try to make things right, and that couldn't be done if I was hiding things from Kari. Up until this point, I had the moral high ground, although my lies and secrets paled in comparison to hers, but lies are lies. Mrs. Watson invited us to sit down. She asked about our evening and Kari gushed about how wonderful it was, like we'd just started dating, and how much she missed that connection. I blushed as I watched her enthusiastically tell her story, not because I was embarrassed, but because I knew that in a few minutes I would destroy this feeling. When the excitement had subsided and Mrs. Watson had given us a few comments, I spoke. Kari, I have a topic I want to talk about, and it won't be pleasant for either of us. My tone was even, and you could see how Curry recoiled a little, not understanding what awaited her. Okay, Dean, what would you like to talk about? asked Mrs. Watson, turning the floor over to me. Trust. The trust between Kari and I has been seriously broken. I want to know how we can get it back, I said, not sure if it was a question or a statement. I looked at Kari, and she was as pale as chalk, I guess because she knew she was going to be under fire again. Kari, you violated my trust. But I also did a couple of things recently. That violated your trust. Her eyes filled with tears. Why you were you with someone else? She finally squeezed out. No, but I was hiding some things from you. The first week after I saw you, I hired a lawyer and asked him to draw up divorce papers. I continued. Until last Friday, I fully intended to file them after these sessions. What? You bastard. Are you still going to get a divorce? She screamed. I was going to. But I love you, and I really want to see if we can fix this. But the two things that bother me are trust and respect. I haven't filed and don't plan to unless we can work this out. I just went to these sessions on the advice of my lawyer, but I see you working on this, and I thought I should put in the same amount of effort. I just sat and looked at her for a minute. But I, we can't move forward if we keep secrets. I said, Dean, I know you, and I knew you weren't fully committed to these sessions. I need to figure this out. But I'm glad you decided we were worth the fight. She held back her tears with a small sob because there's nothing you can't do when you set your mind to it. Is there anything else? She asked timidly. Yes, I'm afraid there is, and it's a big thing. I didn't give her time to respond because I knew she was thinking the worst. I applied for another position in the company. It's a promotion, and it's in Texas. I had a phone interview and went there for an in-person interview a few weeks ago, and it looks like they may offer me the position in the next few weeks. I said and waited. She looked at me in stupor for a minute. I could see her mulling over my words. I can't believe you did this without talking to me. I did it in the first week, thought we were done, and it was only a matter of time. What about it? Were you just going to run away from him? She asked. JT has been my main concern throughout this whole damn case. He's the main reason why I'm sitting in this damn chair and even thinking about giving us a second chance. I started to get a little angry. So, was it the day you dressed up? She asked, starting to put the puzzle together. Yes, I answered. When were you going to say anything? She began to calm down. Honestly, I asked, and she nodded. When I got the offer, but since I decided I wanted to try to fix this, I decided to tell you before they offered the job, so we could make a decision together. I'm not sure I can stay here, Kari, 
Every time I see this house or pass the yoga spot, all I think about is you having sex with that bastard. I probably shouldn't have been so graphic, but I wanted to make my point. Kari stepped back a little and blushed, looking at Mrs. Watson, who was also blushing. Do we still have time to talk about this? She asked. Yes, there are rumors that I may find out in the next couple of weeks. These processes may take some time. I told her. Okay, anything else you lied about? She asked sharply. Now it was my turn to back down a little, but then my anger flared. No, now we need to discuss how I can trust you not to cheat when I'm not around, I shouted to her. Her face turned red and I saw anger on her face for a moment, but then she hesitated because she knew I was right. How can we trust each other, Kari? How can I not worry about where you're going or who you're meeting every time you leave the house or when I'm at work, I asked sincerely. She started crying. I knew she couldn't help herself. Our emotions are running high in this session. I don't know, Dean, but I promise you right now, I will do whatever you want, whatever you think I have to do. Watch me, read my letters, everything you need to trust me. I was impressed that she had really thought about it. I'm sure she and Mrs. Watson probably discussed it during her first private session. I broke your trust, and I know I don't deserve your forgiveness or trust. But I want to earn it back, she added. This is good, I said, because I have two more topics that would be unpleasant to discuss. Oh, okay, go ahead, she said slowly and hesitantly. Was this the first time you had sex with someone since we got married? I began and then added, or even when we first started dating. Oh my God, Dean, she exclaimed. This is the only time there has never been anyone else. She said in an even voice, and then, as if after reflection, added, it was the first time I needed it. It sounded barely louder than a whisper. It was clear from her expression that she didn't mean to say it out loud, and it was a sarcastic remark meant to hurt me. I think she immediately regretted it. Damn you, Kari. Well, now that makes the next question even easier. JT is mine, I asked angrily. Damn you, Dean Thompson, damn you. I knew it would hurt, but I felt like I had to ask. Plus, I wanted to get back at her for her snarky remark. Kari very rarely used that kind of language, so I knew I had offended her. She stood up and looked like she was going to hit me. Tears flowed. I saw the pain on her face. Thought she would leave. She just walked around a little and then sat down, the tears still flowing. Yes, Dean, it's yours, she managed to say. Now it's my turn to regret my tone, even though I didn't regret the question. I'm sorry, Kari. This is what breeds disbelief. These are the questions I've been asking myself from the very beginning. I said calmly and monotonously. I regretted having to ask. She sat and looked at me through her tears for a full minute, wiping them away as they rolled down her cheeks. I see, do you want a DNA test? She asked. Perhaps. I just don't know how we will build the trust necessary for our marriage. I thought out loud. The rest of the session continued in the same vein. Mrs. Watson gave us a few things to think about and some communication tools that can help with trust issues and made us promise to discuss potential work and moving before our next evening, she practically forbade us from discussing it on a weekly date. We hadn't decided anything this week, but now it was out in the open, and we both knew where we stood. The ride back to Kari's house was quiet. Around eleven, I felt the blanket move, and her slender body slid onto the couch with me. I hugged her and pulled her towards me. I think our actions after such an emotional night said a lot. The next morning, my alarm clock woke us both up. She sat up and looked at me as I turned it off. After that session, I just needed to feel you, she said in a sleepy voice. You really hurt me with the question about JT. I know it's a fair question after what happened, but it still hurts and I want to talk about this more. We'll talk, I promise. That's all I could say as I walked around her and gathered my things to get ready for work. I could see that she was on autopilot, and it was too early for her. And it's too early for serious conversations and arguments, so I just continued with my morning routine, and she went back to her room. Rest of the week. The rest of the week passed quietly, we talked more. 
We discussed it a bit, but didn't decide what to do about the DNA test, although I knew I wouldn't push it. I knew it was mine. After a couple of days, I decided that I would not do the DNA test. Kari went to bed with me several more times that week. This was one rule I didn't want to follow. Saturday. I took it to Grandma's for the night so we could stay longer if we wanted. Our date was at a bowling alley with fried snacks and bold hamburgers and a couple of bottles of beer. We laughed and had fun for the first time in a long time. I loved watching her tight ass move as she threw the balls. It had been a long time since we had sex, and I felt the desire building in me. I wasn't sure how much longer I could hold on. We returned home a little drunk. I kissed her on the cheek and went downstairs. I heard a noise when I turned around. She was standing naked. I just looked at her. Eh? I asked. She came up to me, but I stopped her from kissing her. Kari, we can't. I'm not ready for this. It was difficult to express my thoughts coherently through alcohol intoxication, but I knew that this was not the path I wanted to take. I also knew that if I had sex with her, my resolve would weaken. I wasn't ready for this, at least not yet. I saw the pain in her eyes as she, without saying a word, turned and ran upstairs, crying again. Kari should also have realized how serious I was about our situation. I don't remember a single case when I refused her sex. Even when I was furious with her, I made love to her if she initiated. I'm sure her insecurities surfaced after that. Men are such simple creatures. So I think she decided that if she could get me to have sex with her, it would mean that I had forgiven her. She was probably right. I just wasn't ready. Sunday 8. Sunday. Sunday was a quiet day. We said maybe a dozen words to each other. I stopped and bought one pink carnation at the flower market on the way to pick up JT from Grandma. Placed it on the table as she helped JT sort out his things. Pink carnations have always been an inside joke of ours. When we were dating, I once stopped to buy flowers at the grocery store before our date. All they had were red roses and pink carnations. I didn't think we were ready for red roses, so I bought one pink carnation. She accepted it with a slightly puzzled look. Um, um, heard that it means intention. I lied, having no idea that they actually symbolized gratitude. Oh, really? And what's your intention, Dean Thompson? She asked, flirting with me. My intention is to love you forever, I said. We never went to dinner. It has become common for me over the years to stop and buy a pink carnation when I see them. I even gave her one on our wedding day. I don't remember the last time I gave it to her. She left JT's room, stopped in front of the table, and looked at the pink carnation. She took it and looked at me. You are sure? she asked. I understood perfectly what she meant. Yes, was all I said. She smiled slightly and walked into the kitchen and placed the flower in the vase she always used for them. The next time I saw the carnation was when it was standing in the middle of the kitchen table. Monday. I thought a lot about what awaits us next. I remembered Friday when I was fishing. And all the old conversations with my father. I also remembered what he said when I said I was going to propose to Kari. Dean, I think it's wonderful that you want to marry Kari. She's a wonderful woman. But remember that wedding vows are a contract that the husband must honor first. I never really understood what he meant. I always thought it had to do with not marrying lightly. Now, under these new circumstances, I considered it. That night, I looked at our wedding vows, which we had printed and framed next to our photo. Dean, will you take this woman to be your wife and swear to her fidelity, all love and honor, all duty and service, all faith and tenderness, to live with her and love her, according to the divine order, in the sacred union of marriage? I, Dean, take you, Kari, to be my wife, and I promise and swear before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband, in abundance and in need, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, until death will not separate us. I reread these words several times. The part that kept coming back to me was about duties and service. I realized that with my background, I take these terms seriously. I came to the conclusion that I did neither of these things with curry. Tears welled up. I, 
I, I, I stuttered. I'm sorry, I let you down, Kari. It was the last thing I ever wanted to do. You are my light, my heart, and my soul. I failed to play the role of a good husband. My face fell into my hands and I cried quietly. Both Kari and Mrs. Watson took a deep breath and held it. None of them expected me to take the blame for her actions. Even though she cheated, I was the one who broke our vows first by not giving her what she needed, without protecting her from those who wanted to take advantage of the situation. The room was dead quiet, except for my quiet sobs. Suddenly a force came over me that almost knocked me out of my chair. It was Kari. She hugged me and we cried together. She slid down to the floor at my feet and we held hands and parts of our arms. After a few minutes our sobs subsided and we looked at each other. You've never failed at anything in your life, Dean. You've never failed me or JT. Ever. Then why did you disrespect me so much? In our house? In our bed? Because I failed you. I forgot that I should respect and appreciate you and that I have responsibilities to you. She answered, more sobs and tears, and I'm a stupid woman, she said quietly. We sat quietly for several minutes, holding hands. Dean, I know it's my fault. I stole the sparkle from your eyes and replaced it with anger and hatred. I also know that you may never trust me again. She hesitated a little before continuing, but if you let me, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to bring back that spark and earn your trust. She finished. We were both silent for the rest of the session, continuing to hold hands. Mrs. Watson took a moment to emphasize that most situations like ours most often arise because both people forget to protect each other from the outside world. That a crack in the foundation of a marriage, even a minor one, can be exploited by those with selfish intentions to infiltrate the marriage with negative consequences. In her manner, she told us directly that we were both responsible for the situation, as was her seducer, and it would take time and a lot of effort on our part to undo the damage. She didn't let go Curry off the hook. She emphasized that her physical infidelity should not have happened. Mrs. Watson mostly talked to us and finally noticed that none of us were really listening to her. She decided that we could shorten this session. As usual, there was no talking on the way back to Kari's house. I was exhausted, and so was she. Upon entering her house, I simply turned and walked downstairs, exhausted. He sat down on the sofa and then lay down without taking off his clothes. The next morning I woke up and felt my wife snuggled snugly against me. Rest of the week. Our conversations gradually returned to normal, more and more. There were fewer sorries than before. We talked about more than the weather and JT. She looked happier than sad lately, and I felt more love than hate. I was ready to show her out the door and be done, but now I started to remember why I wanted her in my life. I started to fall in love with this woman again. I started thinking about little things I could do every day to show her that I wanted to be there for her. One evening I washed the dishes, laid out the clean ones, and uploaded the dishwasher. Left a note one morning wishing her a good day as a sticky note on her computer screen. Told her she was hot to show his physical attraction to her. She started making homemade dinners more often, packed my lunch a couple of times, and made sure JT's and mine's favorite dishes were on the dinner menu. I was not ready for sexual contact, at least not mentally. Saturday. Our date was low-key this week. Kari packed a wonderful picnic dinner, and we sat in the local park watching children play, couples in love, holding hands, and spending a lot of time looking into each other's eyes. We were watching the sunset when she snuggled up to me, and I hugged her. She lay down on the blanket, which pulled me along with her until I was on my elbow, looking into her eyes. We shared our first loving kiss at that moment. She smiled. She also knew we wouldn't go any further. She didn't suggest or try to encourage anything more. It was like our first kiss, but we didn't go as far as the first time. It was good. It was perfect. We kissed a little more at her door before going our separate ways. Sunday 9. We touched and kissed more this week. It wasn't normal, but it seemed more normal. Before this chaos, our normal was not to kiss or touch, not to hold hands, not to accidentally touch the shoulder when passing by. 
We did this in the first few years of marriage, it was the norm then, but it turned into something else. Now we were somewhere in the middle, creating a new normal. She also found another pink carnation one morning while getting JT ready for the day. Tuesday. That morning I was called into the HR office and was offered the position of operations manager in Texas. I asked for some time to think and explained my current situation to my HR manager. She understood perfectly why I quickly reacted to the situation with thoughts of escaping, and now that everything had changed, I needed to talk to Curry before making further decisions. I was given until next Monday to respond. Our conversation also got me thinking. Am I running? It reminded me of the fight or flight response. My initial reaction was to run away, but now I have decided to fight for what I want, for what is mine. Wednesday, session eight both. Our session started as usual. We discussed our date, conversations we had had during the week, and talked about next steps. About 20 minutes into the session, I interrupted everyone. Kari, I heard back from Texas, I said. About, she replied, and I was offered a job. This is an increase in responsibility and a 23% increase in salary. Did you accept? She asked anxiously. No, I have until Monday to respond. I told them about our situation and that I need to discuss it with my wife. But do you want her? Not as much as you, not as much as my family. I answered firmly and then continued, I don't necessarily want to live in Texas, but I'm not sure how I can stay here. I don't have the same attachments as you, so it's not that important to me to give up everything for a new one. Adventures. But it wouldn't be a standing adventure if I didn't have you there to experience it together. I looked at her and held her gaze. She looked puzzled, confused, but there was a spark of joy in her eyes. I didn't say so clearly that I wanted to reconcile with her before. I think she and Mrs. Watson took this as a good sign. As I see it, we have three options. One, we stay here and continue to work on our problems, and I stay at my current job. Two, we pack up and move 1,500 miles to start everything again. Or the third option, we get a divorce and I leave you here to live your life. I would like us to consider all our options and make a decision together. I saw her flinch at the mention of the last option. I didn't mean to be rude, but it was still an option. Sometimes you're just a real jerk. Her eyes showed a little anger as she looked at me. You come here and say you want us to be a family, and then you throw it in my face. Kari, I may someday forgive you. Hell, maybe I will even trust you again, but I will never forget. I'd rather it be options one or two, I added. Can we set up a time for Sunday at noon to discuss and make a decision? I have a package of information at home about the location, job description, schools, housing market, and job market for you. If necessary, I can get more information from the job, and we can always search on the internet. I really didn't want to take this apart now. I wanted the opportunity, but I needed Kari to decide what she wanted. If she chooses option three, it will be clear that she is ready and wants to move on. If she chooses option one, it won't be as clear, but I would understand that she is not quite ready to see what happens next, and I would be more worried about a possible repeat if we stay here where she is comfortable. People who remain in comfortable situations are more likely to return to inappropriate behavior. But if she chooses option two, we might have a chance. A new place would mean that we would have to rely on each other more, seek comfort from each other, at least for a while. In my twisted logic, that would also mean that she chose me, that I was as important to her as she was to me. We'll find out on Sunday. The rest of the session went as usual. On the way home, she looked at me and asked, Can we go to the club to dance on Saturday? On a date? We haven't gone out like this in a long time. Of course, I answered nervously. I was not a dancer, and in the past, when we went to clubs to dance, she would dance with others or with the group we came with. Just us? Or in a group? I asked. Only we? She answered. This was an interesting turn of events. I didn't know how to take it. I didn't want to be alone in a loud club while she assessed the local guys looking for my replacement, 
but I couldn't refuse her because it was the first time she asked for something specific. Of course, she never let anyone do anything inappropriate when she danced with them, and she never left me without attention. She pulled me out after every other partner and rarely slow danced with anyone other than me. But I still always felt jealousy and loneliness, feeling out of place. Guess I'll have to wait to see what kind of torture she has in store for me on Saturday. Thursday. She picked up the package in the morning, and I noticed she was looking at it when she called and asked for more information about the relocation package. HR emailed it, so I forwarded it to her home. The rest of the week went more or less the same. Kisses, hugs, flirting, she slept more with me downstairs. We talked a lot about potential jobs and moving. She did a ton of research, which gave me hope. Only time will tell. Saturday. We had a small dinner at her house that night, and we took it back to her mom's. She didn't want to get to the club too early, and we decided it was going to be a really long night. She looked stunning in a short evening dress and high heels. Today I was in trouble. There was something in the atmosphere that I couldn't name or define. But it definitely felt like trouble. We arrived a little after nine and found a small table for two. I went to the bar to order drinks for us. The music was blaring. We were on the older end of the crowd's age range, but not by much, so we didn't feel out of place. When I returned to the table, the first wolf was there asking her if she wanted to dance. She didn't see me, but I was close enough to hear the conversation. Wow, you look hot and ready to party tonight, cried the wolf. You should join me and my friends tonight. I guarantee you a good time. He added, Thank you and I'm ready to party tonight. With my hot and sexy husband, she answered. He's the only man I'm dancing with today. Hello, dear, this young man is leaving, she said, looking at me as I approached. He turned and had to look up to see my face. He just smiled and walked away without saying another word. She pulled me onto the dance floor and we danced. I only had two drinks because I was driving, but she was drunk. She also turned down every guy who had the courage to ask the woman with the man next to her if she wanted to dance. She kept her word. She danced only with me and looked only at me. Around midnight she went to the toilet and came back a little flushed and giggling. She wasn't gone long, but my fears jumped to the forefront of my mind. She was flirting with someone. I just knew it. It became obvious why she was flushed when she took my hand and put it on the table. She turned her palm up and threw her panties on her. You have two options, husband. The first is to take me home and continue as we were walking. Or the second is to take your tipsy wife and have sex with her in the parking lot. She came closer, finishing voicing my options. I paid for the drinks as they came, so I put her panties in my pocket, took her hand and led her towards the exit, practically dragging her along in her drunken state with increasing desire. The parking lot was dark and we parked at the far end. We had sex. We need to take you home, I said, still recovering. The ride was quiet as we stole glances at each other with goofy smiles on our faces. When we got back to her house, we started kissing and made love again. I was taking my woman again. We fell asleep somewhere around 4 am, snuggled up on the couch, only to be awakened by the sun shining through the window. Sunday 10. Sunday. Kari asked me to get our queen-size air bed and put it downstairs while she looked for bedding. I loved watching her naked ass bounce and move as she searched for what she needed. After we made the bed, we lay for a long time, hugging. I think you should take this job. She just said it. She mentioned that she had already spoken with the insurance account company where she works, and they had no problem moving her since she was working 100% remotely. Are you sure? I asked. Yes, definitely. I think you're right that we need to move somewhere else and start over. New place. New us. I pulled her towards me, kissed her. We made love for the first time in a long time, this Sunday during the day. We went together to pick up JT and shared the news of moving with him. Monday and Tuesday. I officially accepted the job and Kari, and I began planning the move. Sex was plentiful and freely given these days. Wednesday, Session 9 both. 
During the session, we shared our decision with Mrs. Watson and spent much of the time developing a new plan to get us on track in this new adventure. One of the ideas was to create an agreement between us on how we would move forward both in the short and long term. In our first draft, we came up with eight rules that we must follow. 1. We will renew our wedding vows before we leave. 2. I will pursue her and try to win her love every day. 3. She will work every day to bring back the sparkle in my eyes. 4. No lies. 5. When I fail to cope with the role of a husband, she will tell me. 6. When she fails to cope with the role of a wife, I will tell her. 7. We will have more children when we feel ready. 8. We will continue consultations for at least one year. This was the highlight of our session, and we worked on it most of the time under Mrs. Watson's guidance. Next weeks. We continued the sessions every week. We even extended them until our departure date and worked carefully on the tasks that Mrs. Watson gave us. Kari and I both began to open up to each other more than ever before. I learned so much more about her thoughts, needs, and insecurities. I've also learned to better recognize her moods, not play into them, and reduce her insecurities or at least start conversations about them. Kari also learned to better express her respect for me and my role in the family and how to reduce my fears. She learned to open up conversations about difficult topics, and I, of course, had to learn not to react emotionally to them. We discussed how to rebuild trust. Kari freely gave me all of her non-work passwords for her email and social media and the code to her phone with permission to check at any time, and we added a location tracking app to both phones. I responded in kind, knowing that it would force me to pay more attention to my boundaries and make sure I didn't let the fox into the hen house. We put the house and vacation home on the market, sold it and the trailer, and began remotely searching for a new home with the help of a company-appointed real estate agent. Was it perfect? No, no way, we were fighting. The difference was that we set a time for discussion. It also helped that we assumed positive intent. That is, we tried to assume that what was said or done was not intended to offend or hurt another. Over time, we began to understand each other better and stopped walking on eggshells for fear of hurting the other. Our openness and relationship grew exponentially, and by the time we had our small, intimate vow renewal ceremony on the lake, we were more confident as a couple and family. I never returned to her bedroom other than to help pack and take the mattress, bed frame and box springs to the dump, and just in case the headboard and footboard went with them too. We ordered a new set to be delivered to our new home that we picked out on a short house, hunting trip a week ago. Well, Jim, that's all. Mrs. Watson gave us your name after her research, and we contacted you as soon as we settled. Dean, okay? Uh... Thank you for being so detailed, uh, graphic and honest about your story, and I'll meet with Curry next week one-on-one -on -one to find out her point of view on the situation. You seem to have made a lot of progress, and I look forward to working with you over the next year. The consultant replied, not knowing what he was getting himself into by taking in this new family. One thing he knew was that the next year would be interesting. Dean stood up, shrugged his hand and headed out to his truck to get home to his sexy wife and happy six-year-old son who couldn't wait for daddy to come home. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.